All right, folks, I want to welcome our guest tonight. It's none other than Shane Corson from the Olympic Project. Welcome, welcome to the show, Shane. Hey, Brian, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. It's my pleasure, and, and it's an honor to have you on the show. So let's just get right into the Bigfoot thing, right? So some people have heard you on other shows, I'm sure, but for those of the, us that don't know who Shane Corson is, would you sort of tell us who you are and what got you into this Bigfoot thing? Yeah, my name's Shane Corson, and I uh, grew up in Scotland on a little island called Isla off the west coast of Scotland. It's well known for its uh, its whiskey. It's got a lot of whiskey uh, factories on the island. It's well known uh, for a lot of things, but mainly it's whiskey. It's a beautiful island. And growing up, I was heavily interested in paleontology. I used to write, uh, literally write letters to a paleontologist in Glasgow and Edinburgh and um, get feedback from them just about fossils and dinosaurs in general. My mom actually got me interested in cryptids or cryptozoology, um, getting me books and, and stuff of that nature. Growing up there, obviously, we have Loch Ness Monster, but uh, I was always interested in water cryptids, but also, you know, the Yeti, the Mepinguari, the Yaren, all these different cryptids um, from around the world. But the one that always fascinated me was Sasquatch. Um, so, you know, uh, reading all the books I can get a hold of at that time. Living on an island, I, you know, I had to get a lot of my books from mainland, you know, Glasgow. It's about a two-hour ferry ride. Uh, watched everything I could possibly watch back in the uh, you know, late 80s, early 90s. Come 93, fast forward, uh, we moved to the States. We moved to uh, San Diego area. And I'm still heavily interested in this topic matter, especially the Sasquatch. Now I'm in the States. I'm stateside. So I'm very interested in Sasquatch. Once again, get every book I could get my hands on, watching every TV documentary, every program. Um, and in about 97, I'm getting out of high school and I got my wheels underneath me and I started exploring. This is when I really started getting into uh, what I thought at that time was research and investigating. I would go up and down the San Bernardino Mountains of California, all the way down to Laguna. Um, you know, I investigated things like the Zubies um, and Alpine, um, the desert, you know, the Yucca Man. And I, what really got me really interested was when I started traveling further north and starting to see the the large trees and the vegetation up there uh, getting closer and closer to, I guess, you know, basically to the, you know, the Patterson Gimlin film site. I mean, that area, I, Yosemite, I, I fell in love with Yosemite. That was my go-to about a 12, 13 hour drive for me, but I would go up there every chance I could. And uh, in all those years in California, I never really came across anything interesting. Uh, I did talk to a lot of individuals that had supposedly had encounters and, and documented those and would follow up did a lot of, um, I guess you could say, ambulance chasing. Here's a report. Here's a report. Uh, but I never found anything physical. I never had an experience. I had a lot of bear encounters uh, and, and other animal encounters, all explainable, all natural. And, and then again, fast forward, um, I met my wife in 2006, moved up to Oregon and thought, man, I'm in the Mecca. I'm the Mecca up here in Oregon. So that's when I really started getting out and exploring uh, both the, the coast of Oregon, like the Tillamook area, um, the Halem area, and also the Mount Hood National uh, Forest, everywhere around Mount Hood. And Mount Hood has got a gazillion stories and reports. From about 2008 to 2011, once again, same thing. I really didn't come across anything of real interest that I could even point at being Sasquatch. Maybe one impression in all those years, I thought there might have been something to it discernible, not very discernible, but I thought maybe th th this could be a Sasquatch track. So, you know, I'm, I'm doing my thing. I'm, I'm conducting investigations, solo field research, um, and then moving on to 2011. Uh, while I was working down in Oregon, uh, a couple of my buddies, coworkers, we love to do um, remote backpacking, fishing. I'm a, a big time fisherman. And so that's, that really got me out in the woods even more because I could be killing two birds with one stone so to speak, go out fishing and conduct investigations and hit some of these high mountain lakes, some of the rivers, because they're everywhere in Oregon and the fishing is fantastic. Well, a couple of buddies and I decided to go do one of these remote, you know, three or four day backpacking trips, you know, um, get off trail, find these lakes and fish them. And that's what we, we planned out in the Mount Hood National Forest. We picked out a spot. There's about seven to eight lakes in this area. We headed out um, early in the morning, made it to our base camp, which was at a, the base of a lake. 
really the only accessible point on this lake for the most part. There's a couple other spots, but the best camp spot was next to the lake with a hill next to it. And so uh, once we made base camp, we had plenty of daytime left. So we decided, hey, let's go find one of these other lakes. We can come back in the evening and fish this lake, but let's go find one of these other lakes. Let's go hike. So we, we went on our way, the three of us, after getting set up um, and hiked up this mountain, this mountain range, up this ridge. Uh, eventually, I found that we took a completely wrong turn, got lost way up on this ridge line. One of my buddies, Ian, who was not the most avid camper outdoorsman he's from boston and he was definitely afraid of bears so we're off trail we're seeing bear sign he's kind of uh apprehensive he actually literally brought a pot and pan and was banging it around <laughs> to scare off any bears which we never saw a bear but there was you know scat and claw marks and and whatnot so uh, after he kept doing that you know every so often we we told him to knock it off we were all you know i was armed my other buddy was armed and so and we did have bear spray and stuff but he was really adamant that we had to make noise. So you know, we did our thing. We got lost basically for 17 miles that day. We hiked off trail, on trail, off trail. Um, it got really late in the afternoon when finally we did find our way uh, after like kind of pulling straws. <laughs> we did find our way uh, back to the lake we were looking for. But by that time, it's late in the day. So we decided, well, we know the trail now. Our snuckleheads got lost. Let's head back to camp before it gets dark, back to our base camp, which is about um, two and a half miles away. <laughs> Even though we hiked 17 miles, it was um, not one of my better moments. Um, but we make it back after hiking two and a half miles back to our base camp. We cook a meal. We um, get you know further set up. We do some chatting. We make a plan for the next day so we don't get lost. And uh, call it a night around uh, 1130. Well, we had three tents set up, uh, kind of a triangle formation with my buddy Mitch being closest to the lake. I'm a little further back at the point, and my buddy Ian was uh, further in towards this little hillside, but very close. We're a couple of feet apart, basically, kind of a tight little area. Well, after we go to bed at 1130, we all pass out pretty quickly. About 1.32 in the morning, I awaken. I awoke to what sounded like rocks being clacked together. And it was continuous and it was coming from a distance, but getting closer and closer to us. And I'm sitting there listening going, and it's dead quiet out there. I mean, you could hear a pin drop, no wind, no animal noise, no crickets, no frogs, dead quiet right next to this lake. And I'm thinking, what could that be? And my buddy Mitch is obviously awake because he whispers over and goes, hey, are you awake? And I said, yeah. Well, do you hear that? And I said, yeah. So what do you think it is? I said, I, I'm not sure. It sounds like rocks being clanked together, you know, two smooth rocks just being knocked together, but it's, it's getting closer and closer and it's pretty continuous. So, you know, I'm trying to rationalize my brain, you know, could this be elk, you know, antlers, deer? Um, I'm, I, there's nobody out in this area, nobody. So I'm really racking my brain and it's getting closer and closer. And we're laying there quiet. Ian's snoring away. He's uh, my buddy. Ian, he's snoring away. And then it stops it stops and it gets fairly close within, you know, you know, I would say, Oh, 30, 40, 50 feet, maybe it gets fairly close and it stops. And then we start hearing something what sounds bipedal. I couldn't be sure. Cause it just breaking up branches on the ground or the tree. I couldn't tell at the time, but something was walking around and you could hear the, the, uh, the branches breaking on the ground or whatever. And it's moving back and forth. And then I hear what I think is like a percussive sound, something knocking a tree or something. And Mitch and I are just kind of quiet, just listening. I'm just, I'm weirded out. I'm like, what could this be? No idea. Uh, well, then that stops in the rock clanking or whatever. At that time, I wasn't really sure, but it starts up again and it leaves. It gets further and further away. And the rest of the night, that was it. Ian's asleep. Mitch and I kind of went, well, that was weird. And we went to sleep. We had to be up early. We're going to hit the trail and go do some fishing. And that morning we wake up, we discussed the events of that night, kind of just said, well, I, you know, I don't know, could have been this, come in that. We were really trying to get out to go fishing. And Ian thought we were messing with him. So trying to spook him some more. So we go out that day, we hike, we fish two, uh, two or three different lakes, um, catch, you know, catch a, a lot of fish, come back to camp. We, we, you know, clean them up. We eat them um, back at our base camp. Did the same thing, you know, after we're done eating, we 
We had a little fire going. We're chatting. We're making plans for the following day. Some other lakes we hadn't hit yet to hit those lakes and, and make a plan. Uh, so once again, like I said, 1130 at night, roughly, we go to bed. And once again, 132 in the morning, 130 or it's you know between 130 and 2 in the morning, here's that noise again rock clanking it sounds again and it's it's coming from a distance getting closer and closer and my buddy mitch whispers over to me are you awake i said yeah he said it's back i said yeah so we're listening trying to figure out what the heck is going on here whatever was there last the, the previous night is back now and it gets closer and closer and closer and it stops once again that rock clanking, it just stops and then we start hearing the same thing um movement in on the hillside um my buddy mitch is hearing something to his left i'm hearing something to my right so i'm thinking possibly and we're whispering back and forth about this i'm thinking well maybe there's two of whatever the heck is out there and you know crunch crunch but it's it's more um this night now the second night it's it's a little crazier it it's it's a lot more uh, heavy footfall a lot more sticks breaking branches breaking uh the footfall sounds heavier and it just seems to be circling around our camp. And I'm going, okay, this is, this is, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, my, my head, I'm thinking, could this be, could this be because of the movement and the, the knocking noise? Could this be, could I be having an encounter? But that was kind of in the back of my brain. I was more worried about what was, what was outside our camp and what, what we were going to do if we had to, if it, things escalated basically. So after, we, you know, we hear these breaking and movement and, and it sounds rather agitated in a way that stopped and we're sitting there and it's dead quiet again another quiet night up here in in the uh, mount hood area we're listening i'm laying on my back my heart's kind of beating a little bit and then wham 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 five times the most powerful uh you know what we call power knocks uh, something was hitting a tree so hard you could feel it underneath your tent. You could feel the reverberation, and and it just echoed in this area. Now this lake has a, a like a rock quarry on the side, like a, a rock slide, and it just echoed. I mean, tremendously. So Ian finally is now awake, and he goes, "What the hell is that? What is going on?" He's freaking out. And at this time, I'm like, oh "My gosh, uh, <laughs> that was unbelievably loud and powerful." And Mitch is going, oh, man. And so we're kind of quieting. I said, shh, shh, quiet, shut up, shut up. And as we're laying there again, all kind of quiet, I'm breathing heavy. My, my heart is in my head. I can feel my adrenaline and blood pumping. Up through the trees, I hear something coming through the trees from up above this hill, coming through the trees. And they're all um, Douglas fir up there, really large Douglas fir trees up there, big pines. And it's coming through the trees, hitting the branches. And it, whatever was thrown, what well, was obviously thrown, it, it came through the trees and thud right next to my buddy Mitch's tent, who was closest to the uh, lake. There was a little mud area there with some lilies and stuff. And you could hear it just thud right into that mud. And Mitch goes, oh, my gosh, you know what that was? Right? I said, yeah, that was a rock. Something through. You could just tell. You hear the thud hitting the branches, coming through the branches, the, and then missing his tent, but hitting the mud next to him. And at this time, I'm thinking we're in trouble. I think we're in trouble. My buddy, my buddy Ian is freaking out. And I had, as I've talked about this before, I made a big mistake that trip. I, um, I had an extra weapon with me and I did give it to him uh, the previous day because I didn't want this guy Ian to be smashing pots and being afraid of bear. I said, hey, here's a, here's a nine millimeter. It wouldn't have done much, but I said, here's a weapon, um, you know, just to be comfortable, be safe with it. Well, he's in his tent. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I give that guy a gun. What was I thinking? Because he's freaking out. He's never been really around bear. He's not really an outdoorsman. And we got this going on. I'm thinking he's going to shoot somebody. So I said, calm down, calm down. I'll come over there. Just calm down. And to be honest with you, I did not want to get out of my tent. I didn't want to get out of my tent. I didn't want to go see him. But I thought, well, being shot possibly because I'm a knucklehead and give you something you shouldn't have had in your, your, in your possession. I uh, decided to get out of my tent and at least get the gun away from him, maybe console him uh, with, the, um, <laughs> with the fear of maybe figuring out what was out there. So I unzipped my tent. Uh, from the top and I'm, I'm peering out and I'm looking around and I'm not seeing anything at first. Um, and then all of a sudden I see movement behind the tree. And the reason I saw the movement, let me backtrack a little bit. Every night we went, every night when we went to bed, Ian would build this humongous 
obnoxious fire. It would burn almost till the morning time, just a huge fire. Um, and this is August. So it's a, we, uh, it was warm out. We did have quite a bit of moonlight, but the, the thing was the fire. I think I, I may have not seen anything work for the fire still glowing and about 30 feet away behind a tree. After scanning around, I see movement and I see what I see is something swaying from behind the tree back and forth. And when I really looked at it, I could see a, a hand an arm that was on front of this Douglas burr. And then every once in a while I would see a shoulder and a head basically coming in and out from behind this tree. And instantly I knew I was looking at a Sasquatch. There was no mistake in the size of this thing, the, the, the size of the, what I could see of the chest, the arm, the hand, it was all dark. It was all dark. It looked black or a very dark Brown. I couldn't really tell, but it was humongous and it was just swaying back and forth. And I don't know, if it was looking, I assumed it was looking directly at me. And I don't know if it heard me unzip my tent or whatever have you. It seemed to last an eternity. And I'm just holding my breath that it, it's not seeing me. And it takes its arm off the tree, drops it to its side. It turns around its whole body, turns around, and walks up this trail and disappears. I'm just sitting there waiting for something to happen. Sitting there. I didn't want to move. I didn't want to breathe. After a while, I, I just zipped my tent back up. I laid back down. Nobody was talking. Everybody was quiet. And I'm not sh pretty sure nobody slept the rest of the night. Nothing else happened. When that Sasquatch moved from behind a tree and left, it was gone. I think it made itself known and got its message across because that next morning, I mean, we're supposed to be out there another day or two. We collectively, without talking, packed up our stuff and hiked out and got out of Dodge. and. Uh, it took me, took me a, a good month or so to get back out there. I ended up meeting up with um, one of uh, Cliff Berkman's associates. He's with the BFRO. His name's Will. And he came out there with me and with Mitch, with my buddy Mitch. Ian was done. He didn't want to be back in the woods. He was done. But Mitch and I went back out there with this guy, Will. And we did some recording. We got some possible percussive sounds, some wood knocks of that nature. Um, and I found out more about the history of that area. Uh, and so after that, after that, you know, second camping trip out there to see if anything was going on, I felt, wow, this is, this is what you've been wanting. This is what you've been looking for. You have to continue with this. You have, you, you know where they're at or where they were at. And so I started in my brain, started thinking, why, why did, why did we have a two night experience? Why did we have a two night encounter? Why? That doesn't happen very often. That's very rare. You know, we got percusses, we got a rock. I mean, you know, almost like the perfect storm and i couldn't figure it out and i thought well maybe it's because we're close to the water source we're blocking a water source and that was my conclusion for a while but then i really started really thinking about what transpired well us as a group we got lost we got off off trail we hiked 17 miles up on the you know up this ridge line and different ridge lines we were being loud obnoxious um urinating leaving our scent places uh, and all that i thought maybe perhaps we disturbed something up on this ridge line and in a place where humans don't go, uh, they don't get off trail like that. It was nasty brush. Uh, you know, of course, occasionally do we did, but generally speaking, everybody sticks to the trails. We're predictable. Well, we became unpredictable and probably my best guesstimate to date is that we just got off trail, stirred something up in its house or where it was staying for a period of time. And it wanted us out first night. Didn't work. Came back with Ben second night. It did work. We got out of Dodge. And so I thought for sure for months, I was going to get some sort of really good piece of evidence. At that time, I didn't have a FLIR or thermal imagery device. I had recorders. I had a night vision. I didn't have any of that equipment, but for months, nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. For the first year, I went back up there. I didn't see nothing. I didn't really capture any good audio. And I thought to myself, this is not a one-man show. This is not a one-man endeavor you need to reach out to people have been living up here that are researching investigating this area uh, areas and gain some knowledge and so that's what hooked me up with like the likes of cliff barrickman uh, and Derek randall specifically of the olympic project and i started going on some of his um some of his expeditions Derek and i pretty much hit it off right off the bat and if just a few months later he asked me to join the olympic project and uh I've been doing that ever since. I've been uh, a core member now of the Olympic Project. I'm, you know, uh, right up there. And um, what I, the one thing I take away from the Olympic Project then 
was that what I thought I was doing as a researcher or investigator, I was way off. I was uh, really quite an amateur, not that I'm not an amateur now, but come a long way. I was definitely an amateur then. I was good with animals, being around animals, hiking, all that stuff. But there was so much more to this research, these investigations, to um, looking at things analytically, to collecting evidence and data um, that I wasn't doing at that time. And uh, the Inland Project really opened my eyes, and that's what I've developed now. And so kind of a long story short, that's where I was and where I am now with the uh, being with the Olympic Project. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Olympic Project and what what are you guys currently working on? I know that you guys have been at the Nest site now for, I think you guys started that, if I'm not mistaken, back in like 2016, and that's sort of like a five-year thing. So for those that don't know about the Nest site, can you give us a a history of how that came about and what you guys have been doing there over the last five years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so basically the Olympic project though, it's just, it's a group of like-minded individuals, um, a lot of dedicated outdoorsmen, hunters, um, researchers as layman investigators. We do have some biologists, some archeologists uh, and people from different academic backgrounds that work with us. We have a lot of affiliates as well. Dr. Melvin, we work with closely and Cliff Barrickman and a bunch of others. And so we're, we're about data. We're about collecting data. We're not necessarily out to prove the existence of Sasquatch because the majority of, uh, of the Olympic Project, not everybody, uh, pretty much knows they exist or has had an encounter or something of that nature. So um, we're really about collecting data so that if in that day that Sasquatch is proven to exist, we will have a plethora of stuff collected uh, that can be used to uh, help the species out uh, with academia and science. Now, what we've been working on since you, you are correct there, Brian, uh, since about 2016 is a, what we call a, a nesting area. And so back in, uh, back in 2016, a tim- timber surveyor was out um, marking trees, flagging trees to be timbered in this remote area. It's uh, two and a half miles behind a lock, uh, logging gate and way off trail. And he was out there by himself uh, going up and down these little uh, ravines and up onto these finger ridges or fingers that come off this giant ridge. You know, it's kind of like a plateau that comes off of these, these ridge lines when he was out there. And this guy's been doing this job, flagging trees and working for this timber agency for about 27 years. Um, so he's well experienced with all sorts of stuff, uh, wild animals and, and what they are capable of doing. Well, as he's out there flagging above this river on this plateau, he comes across these large, at the time, I think he found three in a row. Three really large ground nests, not structures, ground nests. If you think of like a, a giant bird's nest, uh, like an eagle or something of that nature, but much bigger, uh, six, seven, eight feet across, uh, oval shaped, over a foot in depth. They were all made out of huckleberry. This guy's looking at these really large ground nests and they're, they're in a cluster, they're all the kind of together close by. And then he's looking at the devastation in this area, all the huckleberry boughs. It's evergreen huckleberry. And all the huckleberry boughs have been snapped off from, you know, a foot off the ground to eight, nine feet off the ground. He's seen the devastation. The huckleberry is still green. So he knows that these nests were made, you know, fairly, you know, within a couple months, if not sooner. Uh, you, generally speaking, with our experiments, it takes the huckleberry to brown. You know, it could be two months, could be three months. Depends on the weather. He's looking at stuff and he, go, he gets a little freaked out. He's never seen anything like this in all of his years. And He's getting weirded out. He decided to backtrack out of there. Well, as he was sitting there thinking about it, when he got back home and whatnot, he he contacted his boss, uh, the owner of this property, um, and uh, now this this timber surveyor. Uh, he uh, had he, he was having some landscape done about ten years prior, and Derek Randalls, who by trade, Derek Randalls, the co-founder of the Olympic Project, by trade is a landscaper, and he knew that Derek was heavily involved with Sasquatch and is an outdoorsman, a guide, he's a hunter. He decided to get a hold of Derek with the blessing of the timber owner. And so they go out there and check this out. So Derek goes out with uh, a buddy of ours, James Million, who's another uh, Lint Project member. Uh, This DNR, or excuse me, um, this timber surveyor, the owner of this company, and a couple of Department of Natural Resource guys, DNR. And they hike out to this area. You know, they go behind the gate, drive, hike out to this area. They get back out there. Between all of them, we're talking over 250 years of woods, being in the woods experience. None of them, not one of these guys had ever in their life seen anything like these ground nests. And they found seven at that time. 
when they scoured this little plateau uh, coming off this ridgeline right above a, a, a creek. They had never seen anything like this. And so everybody was enamored. And so what the timber owner did for us, he said, hey, I'll tell you what, this is really interesting. Um, Derek, if you're interested, I'll give you a key to our gate and I'll let you study this area. We're not in any hurry to, to we got to get permits. We're not in any hurry to timber this area. So you guys can have access to this for, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put it around four years. We'll just stay out of here. You guys can do your thing. Keep us informed of what you find. And so that's what we've been doing. Uh, you know, so for four years, we were, well, for the first year, we'd go out in this area and, and, and check this area out. And we, we eventually, over that first year, year and a half, uh, we, for hundreds of yards, we found uh, on, you basically have one plateau or finger, then, a, you know, maybe 200 yards away, you'd have, you know, you have a yard, uh, ravine, and then another plateau and finger. Same thing, another ravine, and then another plateau and finger coming off this finger ridge. So if you if you think of, you know, if you hold your your hands out flat, you got your knuckles, that would be the ridge line, and then you got these plateaus or fingers coming down. We found uh, 22 nests um, spread out. We found a cluster of seven, then a cluster of three, and then a cluster of four, um, all the way down to the last one, uh, the last finger where there was a nest, and it was the biggest nest of them all. It was, you know, nine feet in oval shaped, just massive. So we, we were excited because we were pulling hair out of these areas. We, we invited Dr. Meldrum out there and we collected a bunch of hair and visually speaking, um, they did a lot of analysis on the hair uh, They came back, you know, Mel, Dr. Meldrum will tell you that it's primate hair. Um, Cindy Dosen of Homini Enigma out of British Columbia looked at this hair, said it's, it's primate hair. It fit, matches some of the suspect hair, or this hair that we, we, we think may be Sasquatch hair based on other samples that she compared it to because it doesn't match any animal out here, you know, uh, actually in North America, period. Uh, it lacks a medulla. So if you think of a pencil, that would be the lead part of the pencil. And that's, it was like a medulla. It was uh, under a microscope. It had reddish uh, pigmentation. A lot of Sasquatch reports you hear about this red, red colored Sasquatch. So the hair stood out. Um, this area, and I'll get into the nest a little bit more of the construction, but you have a lot of stuff going on. You have this evergreen huckleberry. You have the creek down below and this creek down below that time of year uh we 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 found them we thought that these nests were probably made in the months of either uh, you know february or march at that time and during that time in this particular creek you have a large salmon run yeah so much salmon you could walk across them it's like a you know a, a national graphic picture out of uh, you know alaska where the bears are up there so much salmon so you have that protein source down below because it's a large from the from the point of where these nests stop, it's a real steep drop off down to this creek. And then you have another, uh, you base a big ravine, another ridge line on the other side. Um, pardon me. And so you have that, you have the evergreen huckleberry, you have salmonberry, salalberry, uh, um, Oregon grape, you have wild strawberry. You just have a ton of food. You have ungulates in this area, like, you know, deer and everything else, all the other rodents and stuff. Uh, it's, um, it's just a perfect spot to hunker down because when you get down into these nest areas, you can't sneak in there. The huckleberry is upwards of six to nine feet tall. It's very thick. It, you're tripping, you're falling, you're crawling into these areas. You cannot sneak up on this. You'll hear something or somebody coming a mile away. So it's a perfect area. But when you get into these nest areas, it's complete destruction all around. All the huckleberry boughs are broken. All the um, uh, huckleberry limbs are stripped of their leaves. And we did find piles of huckleberry leaves piled up, which I thought was very interesting. The nests themselves, like I mentioned, are over a foot in depth, uh, made totally out of huckleberry boughs. Some of the uh, breaks or two inches in diameter, some of them are just very small tips. Uh, huckleberry, when you get over, it gets started getting larger in size, it's very hard to break. There was no teeth marks, no claw marks. Everything snapped off or peeled off. And then uh, for the, that's what formulated these nests. And when we brought Dr. Meldrum out there and we deconstructed one of these nests, he noticed that some of the huckleberry boughs were actually um, pushed into the ground. And then the huckleberry was kind of woven or, or you know, it's almost like a frame. And then you use the branches to construct the actual bed itself. Very comfy to lay in. Uh, when, and, and I thought that was profound when we deconstructed one finally. And the amount of huckleberry uh, branches and stuff. I mean, 
it's hard to explain how much Huckleberry uh, was used. It was tremendous amounts of Huckleberry. And one of the other interesting things was James Milling, while scouring this area originally, he came across two rocks about a little bit smaller than softballs at what we call the point nest, because the way these nests are laid out on these plateaus or fingers, it's um, triangular shaped. It's, um, you know, a lot of elk will lay down that way, bed down because it's, it's a strategy. Um, one, of our, um, one of our members, uh, Tom Baker, who was a former Top Gun pilot, when he first saw the, how these nests were laid out and constructed, he said, this is very military-like. Something with, this took brains to lay these nests out and put them in this fashion. Well, these two rocks were at the point nest, which faces that steep decline down into the um, ravine, into the creek, the river. And when he picked up these rocks, uh, James Millen, he noticed that there were score marks on them. There was white marks where something, something or someone at one point in time had clanked those rocks together. And so we thought, wow, that's really interesting. Um, I'm trying to think here. I lost my friend, uh, train of thought there. So we have these large ground nests. We have hair. We got these peculiar rocks. We have the location. Uh, this area is known, just general area, is known for Sasquatch reports and sightings. It's got a history. We, um, we spent the four years looking for more nests in this area. When we found the 22, um, our end goal in mind was to, okay, this is a western-facing slope. We got a salmon bearing Creek. We have very thick huckleberry. It's hard to get to. We kind of have a, Emma, we kind of had an idea where to find nests possibly based on what was there now. So we started scouring other areas looking for, in different areas, looking for more nests because it has to be repeatable in other places. No matter what's making them, it has to be repeatable. And so we started looking at things, you know, different areas. And before I get into, I guess, uh, the most recent find, um, a good friend of ours, uh, Wes with Squatcher Metrics. He's, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Squatcher Metrics. You can find him on Facebook, on Instagram. He's a He's a, a, an, a, data, an, an, a data analysis, uh, an analytical guy by trade. Fantastic. You got to look him up on Facebook if you guys are, are into that thing. He puts out a lot of data. He worked closely with the Olympic Project and many other investigators, research groups around the country. Uh, he asked me one day, he goes, you know, Shane, what are, are there any, you know, they're made out of huckleberry. These nests are made out of huckleberry. Obviously, that's the most prevalent plant in this area. You do have Salau, which is a ground cover. But why the huckleberry? Is it just because it's there? And he asked me a question. He goes, are there any medicinal purposes to these, to these, uh, this huckleberry? I said, you know what? I never even thought about it. I haven't looked. So after doing a little research, he gets back to me. He goes, well, come to find out that doctors used to give women uh, after childbirth a concoction of huckleberry leaf and sugar to help them regain their strength. Um, and, uh, there's some ferns in this area that have the same sort of medicinal purposes. Well, that really got my wheel spinning because our running hypothesis as to if Sasquatch is making these nests, that this may be a birthing area or a nursery area based on some of the sizes, not all the nests were six or eight feet across. Some were much smaller, uh, more round and oval. In fact, uh, two of the nests that we discovered in this area, um, hundreds of yards apart, uh, were actually built in into the huckleberry uh, bush itself, a couple of feet off the ground, but a mirror image of what was on the ground, but in the in the the bush itself, which was fascinating. It couldn't hold any weight, and I remembered something Derek had said years ago he, when we first came across this. He'd said, "You know, I've done all this research on these nests. The closest thing they resemble is a gorilla a gorilla nest. That's the closest thing they resemble." and to date, everything I've looked up, this is the closest thing they resemble is a gorilla nest. Uh, well, gorillas, apparently mother gorillas help teach their, um, you know, their little ones to pr build practice nests in, in the surrounding area that mirrors what's on the ground. Uh, the little ones will practice and that's how they learn how to make nests. So I really got my wheel spinning. Okay, you got this medicinal purpose. If this is a birthing area, well, then maybe the Sasquatch is eating the leaves because we did find piles of leaves plucked off. Maybe it's eating leaves either for a, a water source, as a lot of primates do. They don't necessarily drink out of creeks to get their water from leaves. But maybe it's, it's to regain their strength, you know, after childbirth. And then, of course, you have the salmon bearing creek right there. You can nip down there and grab salmon. You have all the other uh, food resources in this area, plus the privacy. Nobody's coming into this area 
unannounced. Um, one of the other interesting things about this area was, like I mentioned before, the huckleberry um, branches were completely stripped of the huckleberry leaves. But what I noticed uh, beside maybe a, a food source was that by doing that, in that formation, that triangular formation of the original nest area, not the other, you know, uh, 20 or 14, you could see every other nest. If you did not pluck the leaves off, in some cases, some of the branches weren't broken off. They were just twisted behind other branches. But that gave you direct view of the smaller nest, the bigger nest. Every other nest could see every other nest, what's what laying in them. So I thought that's, that's intelligent. That's smart. If you're a family unit of something, you're going to want to be able to see each other. Uh, you can't do that unless you twist branches, break them off, or strip the leaves off. So um, that is that. Is, there's so much more to this nest area. I mean, including the fact that you know we disassembled a nest, but Derek Randalls and I decided to. Uh, the one thing we hadn't done yet was actually reconstruct the nest. Let's say, hey, let's see what it takes to do uh, to make one of these nests. Um, and so we set off to do that uh, back in the, the month of January, a couple of years back. We went out to the woods. We collected huckleberry boughs and breaks uh, you know obviously we can only reach so high up so we had certain limitations some of the huckleberry was too thick for us to break we weren't strong enough and and i consider myself a fairly strong guy and Derek definitely is a strong guy uh, we're going to break some so we just built a ground nest as best as we could between the two of us it took us about 45 minutes 35 45 minutes and also um we had to venture out uh you know more than 25 feet away to collect more huckleberry so we had to transport Huckleberry from 25 feet away just to make a, a closely resembling uh, match to what we came across. And that was the most eye-opening thing for me. That amount of time it took, the, the sheer amount of Huckleberry we had to collect. Um, and we watched that uh, over a couple months to see how it dissolved and, and how it, uh, you know, what would happen with it. And when it eventually you know, decayed, we realized we still hadn't collected enough Huckleberry, that there was even that much more Huckleberry in the original nest areas. So it took something, um, something with strength, uh, something that could reach and pick off huckleberry boughs taller than us. Um, it took, as Dr. Meldrum will tell you, it took something, most likely, I mean, almost without a doubt, something with an opposable thumb uh, to break off and peel these branches because there's no claw marks, no teeth marks. Uh, and that we didn't, us, you know, us two hairless apes did not do a good enough job making these uh, ground nests, that it, there was much more to it, something with knowledge and experience built these ground nests. So, um, so we started formulating ideas, hypotheses, and plans. And our goal after that for the next four or five years was to find more nests. And that's what we were up to with little, with actually no success in any other areas we were looking at. And this is a vast area, lots of same sort of formula, Western facing slope, ridge lines. We didn't have any luck. And uh, Brian, I don't know if you want me to continue. I can tell you about our newest find back in 2020, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hear about it. Okay. So yeah, like I said, for four or five years, we were out looking for more nests uh, with no luck uh, whatsoever, um, you know, and, and conducting other stuff. You know, we're, 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 we were out there thermal using thermal imagery, looking for impressions, which we did. We found quite a few good impressions that we attribute to Sasquatch and a few other things, but our main goal is just to see if we can duplicate this find. And uh, Derek, Randalls were at, Derek Randalls and I were out in this um, new area. It was only about maybe 2,000 feet away, but another ravine that he really wanted to search out that we just kind of skipped around. Uh, so we went out there uh, in January of 2020 and walked in there, and you know, it was raining. We got soaking wet, and we come across – for the first time, what we thought were possible older five, six, seven year old ground nests uh, that were completely, there were deep impressions in the ground uh, where something looked like some large had laid at one point in time based on the soil and it looked like kind of a mound where a nest may have been, but be because of the animal movement, the weather, snow, wind, rain, deadfall, they were not really recognizable. You know, if you, you could walk right by them and I think twice about them, but we thought, hey, these are the closest thing we found. Maybe there's a chance. And so we spent a little time out there, um, not research or looking at the whole ravine. And we head out with the plan to come back there the next available day or, or week we can get out there. Well, a couple of weeks later, uh, this is in February, uh, towards it actually, uh, tail end of February, I invited my buddy um, Todd Hale out to this area with the goal of 
looking at the rest of this ravine that we had not searched through. Um, so we, we got out to this area, you know, going through the gate, we find a little spot to camp. And before we set up camp before this is like four in the afternoon, it's going to get dark. So we decided to hike out. I was going to hike them out and show them this ravine, just show them we're going to be researching, looking at the next day. And we'll hike back to our camp, set up our camp, call it night, get up early and hit it hard. Um, so we do that. We, we leave our camp spot. We hike out to this area. We're going through the, once again, it's the same stuff, really thick huckleberry. I mean, you do have to be careful because there's a lot of bear and other animals in this area. And, and you can't see, but a few feet in front of you, you can jump anything at any, any given time. So we're trying to be fast, but we're trying to be observant for a lot of reasons. And as we're going through this area, we get to the end of where this ravine starts. And I can kind of see another like finger or plateau. I'm like, well, that looks kind of interesting. And, but we were just going to go and kind of look at it from a distance because uh, we're losing daylight and we want to set up camp. But this, I'm like, oh, this is where we need to come back. Uh, Derek and I had not been here yet. So as we're approaching this uh, and I pass this tree, there's a tree and I pass, and I start going down a little bit into the ravine. Well, Todd Hale fell behind me and he starts cussing. He's, oh, I just, you know, he fell down. He's, he's getting angry. It's slick. It's wet. Well, as he did that, I hear movement in front of us and it sounds close and it sounds like it's coming at us and it sounds large. And now instantly I'm thinking bear, uh, bear, elk, something. But it didn't sound like it was moving like an elk. I'm thinking bear and it's getting closer. And Todd Hale, God bless him. He's a, he's a motocross guy. He's been riding his whole life. He's uh, into loud, loud, loud music <laughs> and he's a, um, a construction guy by trade. He's deaf. He's just half deaf. Well, I'm, I stand up, you know, I'm standing there. I'm hearing this thing. I said, Shh, quiet, quiet. I hear it's something big there. And he, he can finally hear it. That's how loud it was for him. He's like, I can hear it. And it was coming at us, but I couldn't see any movement in the huckleberry. It was still a little ways away and probably just down a little bit further in the ravine, but I could hear it. I'm thinking it's coming at us. Well, then it stops and it starts going back down into the ravine. And it sounds large. It sounded bipedal to me. It most, when you run into bear and I've run into a lot of bear, almost 10 times out of 10, almost, you'll see them. They'll shoot off in a straight line. They'll take off. They usually know you're coming a mile away. And a lot of times you don't see them. But when you do, they're usually just, you see the back end of them. They're just fucking it. Well, this thing went back down in the ring and started circling up this hill side around us. Started circling up behind us. And I got weirded out. I said, dude, this is no bear, man. And Todd's hearing it. And it's breaking branches. Then it gets really quiet. So I said, I'm not feeling comfortable down here at this lower position. Let's get back up on the hill. See if we can at least get back up there at a, a better vantage point. Maybe we'll see it. Uh, at least it won't circle up behind us. So we did it. We backtracked our way, got back up on the hill from descending in slightly into this ravine. And we listened for, I don't know, seven minutes or so. And we could hear it every once in a while. And then the last couple of minutes, we didn't hear anything. And Todd looks at me and goes, hey, you know, we figured I had left, but we said, Todd says to me, hey, I think let's, um, let's go back down to where we originally heard that and see if we can find anything. So we do that. We backtrack down into this little ravine area. We head towards the finger where this thing was originally. And that's when we noticed like a trail, like something big had been walking down this trail, crushing the salal, crushing um, a few uh, large uh, fallen trees, uh, you know, maybe 13 inches across or, or in th diameter. Um, something big had stepped on them, but there was a trail where the salal had been stepped on. Something big and heavy had been moving through there. It's very, very obvious. It's almost like a game trail, but not quite. And I look up and the sun's still up and I start seeing all these huckleberry breaks everywhere and they're shining because they're fresh the moisture is still on the huckleberry bow and the sun's hitting it just right and I went holy crap todd there's a nest there i guarantee it and i just knew in my heart of hearts there was a nest there with all the huckleberry breaks it was an exact mirror image of what we've been finding in the other primary nest area so we decided to backtrack out there one because it's getting dark two i didn't want to touch anything um for collection purposes and for scientific purposes to get the right people in there to look at this. So we backtrack out of there. We make it back to our camp. I called Derek Randalls, told him the news. Um, so we went to bed that night. Derek Randalls meets up with us the following day. We hike back to this area. And as we're hiking back in there, Derek's getting a little more excited because he's starting to see the same patterns, the same stuff. And then as we move further into this area, there was an absolutely tremendous pile of huckleberry uh, that had been collected and was starting to be formulated into a nest. So instantly we knew we had found a brand new nest in the making. Um, 
and we knew that we had disrupted that stuff was fresh from that night, maybe the following day, but it was fresh. And the amount of Huckleberry breaks, once again, foot off the ground to not over nine feet off the ground, some just the very tip, some two inches in diameter. It was tremendous. So um, once again, we didn't want to touch anything. So we get a hold of, uh, you know, we hike out of there. We get a hold of Dr. Meldrum. And this is, this is uh, now, you know, uh, this is the end of February leading into March of 2020. We get a hold of Meldrum. We're going to fly him out. We're going to get a hold of some biologists. Well, what happens? The pandemic happens. Mm. And so after a couple of days, we decided not to bring Dr. Meldrum out. It was just too risky at that time. We didn't know what we were dealing with, with the whole COVID thing. We canceled all those plans. Um, we decided uh, just to investigate this area. Uh, James Milling of Leland Project comes out to this area, and we're just scouring this area looking for more nests. James decided to go down to where this thing had circled up around us originally, and he found these two hand impressions that were going up this hill where this thing most likely went up and circled around us. And um, one of them was a really nice a left hand. And then there was a right hand, but the, the right was kind of, you see the fingers, but it was kind of pushed into the uh, pine needles uh, spread out right behind this log. So basically it would have been kind of tucked behind this log and it could have looked up maybe at us. I don't know, but that it probably ascended this game trail and circled up behind us. So we had that. We didn't want to touch it again. We were thinking we can collect stuff from that you know, skin or soil sample, something, you know, some sort of collection. Well, like I said, the COVID thing happened. Uh, we decided to cancel people's flights out. The weather's about to turn south here. We were looking at possible rain, well, definite rain, maybe snow. And we're like, man, a lot of stuff could be destroyed. So between Derek and myself, we decided that we would just go in there and collect whatever we could. Let's collect the, the Huckleberry breaks, the, 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 uh, the um, actual Huckleberry boughs that were broken, that would be formulated into the nest. We're going to start casting everything we find um, and collection, 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 take a notes data. And we invite Cliff Berkman out. And the original uh, day that Cliff came out, Cliff uh, casted the two hand impressions. Well, we decided to, uh, you know, he spent a couple of days there. We went back to the primary new, where the new, new nest was being formulated. And uh, between Todd Hill, myself and Cliff, we found, I think, four or five good or decent uh, foot impressions which we casted, uh, we collected uh, a lot of hair. Um, we found some, another partial hand impression in an area on dirt. And so we just collected all that stuff. We collected, I'm still sitting on bags of, um, bags of uh, huckleberry that I need to collect the hair from. They're in giant, base, basically giant paper, 30 gallon bags from Home Depot. I have collected a lot of that hair, it's in envelopes uh, with a plan of sending out to uh, Cindy Dosen in, in British Columbia and Dr. Meldrum and a few other labs outside of Sasquatch, of course. Um, but what, 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 I guess the end thing here is this, what we came across was a new nest, but not just a new nest, a new nest in the making based on what we think we were looking for kind of proved it to be true. Another wasting Western facing slope, a salmon bearing Creek, thick huckleberry, the same sort of stuff. And it was made in the month, most like, you know, February, then of February, March, we think these nests are made in February, March. And that kind of once again, proved our, our or possibly proved our theory in this remote area, uh, you know, that these nests are, you know, being made and when they're being made, we disrupted something making one of these nests. So it just really, we're starting to see possibly patterns of predictability. Now, are these nests being made every four to five years? Is there a pattern there? Cause we found another one, a brand new one. Um, why, when all those are still questions we have, but now we're pretty confident that in some of these other areas, we may find older nests or newer nests. Uh, what we're really trying to do right now is actually stay out of these areas in those months. Because I, when, when I went into that area and disturbed whatever was making that nest, I actually felt, to some this may sound stupid, but not to me. I actually, I disrupted something building a nest, regardless of what made it. You can argue that all day. Something was making a, a bedding area, a nest. And it took a lot of work. It took a lot of time. And it never came back. Once it was discovered, it never came back. And I actually felt a little bit guilty about that. Um, I wish I had got something on camera. We had our GoPros running. You had the whole experience. Todd and our experience is on GoPro. We never saw anything. Uh, the GoPro, you pick up a few uh, breaks, but it didn't, didn't pick up very good sound. Um, had I got something on camera or on my GoPro, I would have felt a lot better about it. Uh, we do have a lot of you know, data and, and physical stuff that we collected. Going forward, I think what we're going to do in some of these areas, at least, is stay out of there in the months of February, and March, and then go back in and see if we can collect 
the after fact, the, the nest and, and collect that way. That way we're not disturbing something because I do want whatever's making these nests to come back. Uh, obviously they've been coming back for years. In my opinion, we found plenty of tracks over the years in these areas. We collected a ton of data. They're coming back to this area for a lot of reasons. And I don't want to disrupt that. Uh, even trying to get the perfect thermal video or the perfect video. I don't want to disrupt that. And I, you know, I felt kind of guilty doing that, even though it was by pure chance. It was literally, I could have gone, Todd and I could have gone 20 feet to the left, 20 feet to the right. Probably would never have come across that, maybe the following day, but that day we never would have come across that nest being made uh, or whatever was making it. So that's what we've been working on. We got plans for uh, this upcoming uh, fall and winter and then plans for the, you know, you know, further going into spring in this area. We're really about just uh, staying in one area, not ambulance chasing. We got a lot going on in this area. A lot of stuff still to work on bringing in the right people of academia into this area uh, and with their foresight and, and knowledge and skills to help us build a, not a case, but help us figure out exactly what's going on. And uh, we've gotten a lot of, you know, we brought primatologists into this area. We brought archaeologists, we brought an, um, anthropologists, <clears throat> we brought some zoologists out to this area, the original nest area. And, <clears throat> pardon me, and they all say the same thing. They don't know what biologists, bear biologists, they feel this, this isn't bear behavior. This is uh, very odd. We don't know what's doing this. We have no explanation. We, um, the zoologists that came out, uh, a male and a female from a, a zoo out here in North America, they were enthralled by what they were looking at because they worked with directly with, <clears throat> pardon me, they worked directly with chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and uh, they could see individual characteristics in every nest like they would expect to see at the zoo with the chimps and stuff. They would build their own nest, their own little way, have a little, you know, their own little pattern. They could see that. I had never even thought about that before and i thought that was really profound and they thought they were very primate like they looked a lot like what they were used to dealing with in zoos now we don't have silverbacks running around up here that i'm aware of <laughs> or chimpanzees or anything like that but we do have something very similar going on up out here and so our goal is just to collect as much data and keep uh, trying to come up with patterns and ideas as to why when how and all that stuff and it's really been a goal of ours to continue with that being skeptical, but also, um, you know, we, we're, we're all confident what we're dealing with here based on the, the absolute ton of information we've collected and, and evidence. Um, we're just trying to see if it's replicatable and actually completely other areas because what a lot of people aren't aware of that are familiar with our nest study area is that there have been other nest mounds throughout history. Uh, Lyle Laberty interviewed a guy by the name of, um, uh, oh man, his name escapes me. Um, Lyle Laberty interviewed this individual um, who was in uh, Northern California back, back in 1967. Um, he was a, worked for the timber company. Um, I said, Daniel Perez, excuse me. Daniel Perez interviewed Lyle Laberty. That's his name, Lyle Laberty. Daniel Perez interviewed this gentleman. And back in 1967, this gentleman was out in a remote area and found what he described as a large nest above Scorpion Creek. A very large nest made out of, uh, it was different material, very large nest uh, above, on a finger, above a creek, Scorpion Creek. Well, Scorpion Creek feeds into Bluff Creek, 1967, Patterson-Gimlin film. You have a female, most likely a female Sasquatch. Well, if, if it's a Sasquatch, it definitely was a female. But did she, was she given birth, about to give birth? All those things run through my head when he came across that nest, when I figured about that. And it's just a stone's throw away from where Bob, Gimlin and Roger Patterson filmed Patty, but there was also a nest found in that area. Uh, there's been a nest found in North, you know, um, Northern California, Oregon, Washington, uh, in the book Raincoat Sasquatch, uh, which is a really fantastic book. Uh, there's a, a picture of a nest there that was, I believe, found in Alaska. So Canada. So there have been other nests found, just never this many. And nobody spent this amount of time looking at them or trying to figure them out. So there is a precedence for nests. I've always found it fascinating because I talk to a lot of people who find stick structures, right? It's, it's not a nest, but it's a stick structure. And you have to be very careful with that, I think, because when people have experiences, 
often everything then becomes Bigfoot, right? So if there's an X, if there's two sticks laying in the ground and it's an X, then it must be a Bigfoot. So, but I get a lot of people sending me evidence from the Uwari National Forest area here in North Carolina, for example. People send me these things and it's clear to me that it's sticks and boughs and, and trees woven together by something that has opposable thumbs. So there's really only two things that it could be. It's either a human doing this saying, hey, it's a, it's a Bigfoot or it's a Sasquatch, right? And I found it fascinating with these nests that you guys have found. It's clear, like, like you said, Dr. Meldrum said, something's got to have thumbs to do this. It's not bare. It's, and I'm, I find it very interesting that you guys have had this amount of time. And I know you're coming up on that, that five-year stretch that, that you were given. What's going on with that? Is it being extended for you guys to continue the work? And ultimately, what's the goal? Because when I had Dr. Meldrum on the show, we talked about DNA. And we talked a little bit about eDNA. And I said to him, you know, what's it going to take to prove these things are real? Is it going to be DNA? And, and of course, his, his scientific answer was, well, Brian, no, because you don't have anything to compare it to, right? So you're collecting these samples and you're, you're finding this hair and the lack of the medulla and the things that we attribute in the community to being Sasquatch or Sasquatch-esque. But we really don't have any comparison. So I guess my that's that's a lot of questions. I apologize. But you you guys are the first question is you guys are going to be able to continue there at the site. And then ultimately, what is the ultimate goal for you guys over the amount of time that you're going to have left in the in the area? Yeah, so basically, um, <clears throat> basically, the um, we've been extended. <clears throat> Sorry, you have to excuse me, <clears throat> my throat cough away i'm a good editor <laughs> i can fix it. i'm glad man i'm like losing my voice here <clears throat> dang it <clears throat> hope I'm okay i feel like dryness in my throat um okay i'm ready i suppose <laughs> now uh we've been given uh we, actually we have no no idea how much more time it's gonna be a couple years at least in this area to further our research because uh, having talked with the timber owner and he knows some of our more recent finds he said it's going to take him a while to get permits in this area because it's so close to a salmon barren creek <clears throat> they have plenty of time to timber other areas they're in no hurry whatsoever so we're really stoked and happy about that that's a uh, that's got us excited because uh, we're out there quite frequently um we are in the, the business of collecting soil and everything we can get our hands on. Like I stated, we're not necessarily out to prove the existence of Sasquatch. We're just about collecting data. Um, I, I mean, obviously, I agree with Dr. Meldrum. I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a layman, <clears throat> a, a citizen scientist or whatever you want to call me. <clears throat> but um, it, eDNA, uh, so it's not enough. You, you're going to need, a, as most people know, uh, some sort of a body. You're going to need a, a body at the end of the day. Oh, if we stumble across one or something of significant, sure, we're not out actively out there. Like some organizations, and I got a lot of respect for them, we're not actively out there trying to call one. Um, but that's what science requires. Now, if we can collect enough samples, enough really good solid samples, whether it's through water, as you can do a lot of environmental DNA through water, which is actually one of the better options if you have a recent something happen in that area. Uh, soil, um, hair is tough. Uh, it's getting better, but I mean, even a lot of your CSI investigators, uh, they don't really test hair. They'll look at it. Uh, a lot of this hair, you don't find, you know, a shaft or the, the end piece, which would be the best option to look at DNA wise. But we are going to collect samples. We're going to continue to collect samples and look outside, uh, outside of the, the Sasquatch world, because really you need labs that are have nothing to do with Sasquatch. And there's a lot of, you know, eDNA specifically. There are these labs, uh, whether it's in, you know, Canada, uh, the uh, Americas, um, Europe, Australia, there's a lot of new labs popping up with new techniques that make it cheaper and simpler. They'll send you kits to collect it. Um, Great Britain's got a lot of good ones. Australia, uh, in a lot stateside here. There's a lot of I mean, eDNA still, relatively speaking, a new thing. And what they can do with 
you know, this environmental DNA with the work they do on it. It's, it's truly mind blowing. It's, it's every lab's got a different technique or coming up with a newer technique. Um, so I never, I never say that Sasquatch couldn't be at least given more notoriety or maybe make academia look at it more serious. If something substantial is taken from that environmental DNA, that's what I think is going to be the best option is uh, to get more academic individuals looking at the stuff going well. You know, hey, we tested this once, we tested this twice, we tested multiple samples. This is interesting. There's something to this. Uh, and maybe the funding for, uh, not your researchers per se, but maybe academic individuals to get out in the field and collect their own samples and start looking at this a little more serious. That's where I think the eDNA and environmental DNA and the samples being collected um, and documented with, uh, as a whole, I think that's really what the, the purpose there, the best option is uh, until someone comes across a body or whatnot, if you know, you're know you out, out there trying to prove the existence of Sasquatch. So there's a lot of hope for that down the road here. And there's always new techniques, like I said. Um, so I encourage people to collect something, you know, collect it and um, uh, do your homework. Uh, I get contacted all the time. Well, where should I send this? And I don't have a great answer for people. I can send them to some individuals um, in the Bigfoot world that have a little bit of academic background, but they're still involved with Sasquatch. I'm always telling people, if you can find a local university or something that may <clears throat> do some free work for you and give you some preliminary answers, that's the best option. But there's, uh, I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing done with uh, both researcher investigator and in, in the uh, environmental DNA stuff. Um, I'm also very encouraged too with uh, academia. Uh, you know, I work with uh, Amy Boo and she, she founded the project zoo book. I, I I'm like a core member of that as well. And I, there's a lot of academic law scientists that come to our discussion. You know, it's basically a round table discussion, um, a think tank, a question tank. And there's a lot of what I call um, scientists in the, the Sasquatch closet. They're, 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 they want to talk, but they don't want to come out quite yet. There's a ton of them. There's an absolute ton of them. And many not even involved with Project Zoo, but, but from all backgrounds, um, you know, marine biologists to anthropologists, primatologists to entomologists to, uh, that are just, very interested because they've looked at some of this stuff and, or, or just interested in general and think scientists, academia as a whole should look at it more, a little more serious. And that's been such a really, really cool thing um, going forward. And they're very interested in the data, the analytics, um, you know, I mean, stories are stories. They're always interested in those, but they're really, you know, they want the meat on the bones there. So that's something one project has been working on uh, in, in, cohesion with uh, cohesion with uh, project zoo book um and going forward we're going to continue to do that to, to encourage academia scientists and whatnot to look at this stuff uh you know we're most of us are a bunch of amateurs and we want their opinion especially with their backgrounds and so that's got me in the last two years that's been one of the most exciting things other than the nest um and and a few other things but really got me excited about the future of this um of this uh you know of our passion yeah, I think that's great. I've got, I actually had an interview with Amy set up and we had to cancel. She had something come up and we've got her back on the books, I think in the next month or so to come on the show and talk about some of that stuff. And I got to talk about that with Dr. Meldrum as well when he was on the show. It was very encouraging to hear him say that there were so many younger academics that were coming up and, and attending some of his classes that were interested in the subject because like he said, I'm not getting any younger and it's harder to get out in the field, you know, himself and somebody has got to pick up that torch and carry it. And I think it's very encouraging to hear that the science, there are scientists that are sort of coming out of that closet and, and willing to take a look at this because I, I always challenge people. I'm very skeptical myself. You know, I was, I was in law enforcement for 16 years and I have a very one-to-one -one correlation kind of mind. You know, I like to have that. It's not just about the story. I do a, my podcast is based on stories, basically. I, I, and I think they definitely have their place. And I think that anecdotal evidence has certainly taken us down the road of, of sort of showing that these things have patterns of behavior that are happening across the country and even around the world. So, but I think the real way to get to the answer is the science. And I think scientists listening to people in the field and then actually going out in the field themselves and, and taking a look at what's happening. I think if you do that for 30 minutes, 
there's no denying the amount of evidence that we have anecdotal or not that these things are real you know and i think it's very important that we get the academics on board and the way to do that is very carefully bringing them on board with some of the things like the Olympic projects do. And I think the real work in the field that you guys are producing and they have something a to look at and B it's something they can look at seriously because there's no other explanation for it. Right. So I, I really, I love the fact that you guys are out there doing the work and I really appreciate it because my research is done behind a microphone. I listen to people's stories and I read a lot of books, but I'm not out in the field like you guys are. And I know it's not easy. Like you said, these things, are not on the side of the road, right? It takes a while to get back there. And it's a sort of a labor of love to continue this work. And I, I really applaud you guys for, and gals for getting out and actually doing the field work. So that said, what's next for you guys, you know, moving forward and, and how can people find the Olympic project? And is there a way to support you guys? Or, or do you have a website where we can go and take a look at the evidence that you guys are collected? Where is that stuff stored? And where can we find you? Yeah, so I mean, for the future of the Olympic project, basically is this, to continue working on in uh, patterns of predictability, collecting the data in all shapes and forms. It's a very uh, detailed and sometimes very boring process because a lot of people think, well, there's nothing going on, there's nothing going on, but you have to, those are some of the best times to be collecting, you know, barometric pressure, the weather. Why is there nothing going on at this point in time? You know, and if you don't, if you're not there for the, the good, the bad and ugly, you're not going to know. So it's collecting data, data, data. That's what we do. It's what we do best. That's our passion. We're trying to make the subject uh, less taboo. As a, a good friend of mine, the late, great Dr. John Bindernagel, uh, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, some of us, uh, your Dr. Meldrums, your, you know, Grover Krantz's, your Renee DeHinden's, your John Bindernagel's. Uh, I want to do them justice, all of them, uh, and uh, make the subject less taboo uh, across all platforms. So that's definitely, I know I can speak for the Limp Project. That's definitely one of our goals. It's always been one of our goals. Um, so that's, you know, that's what we're up to, you know. And so going forward, one of the things we've really been doing a lot uh, since the, well, for a long time is we, we do a lot of long-term audio recording. Uh, Chris Spencer and David Ellis of the Olympic Project uh, got a lot of hands in that as far as uh, doing the long-term audio stuff. We go place out long-term audio units that record for up 30 days in this area. So we don't have to be there per se. Uh, we do a lot of short-term audio. Uh, so with, in conjunction with the Nets, we have a, a tremendous amount of audio, a uh, tremendous amount of really, <laughs> really peculiar, very interesting audio from this area that helps us also paint a picture of what's going on, both with known animals and unknown animals, because they all play a role. Uh, many uh, symbiotic, symbiotic relationships going on there. And this you know, weather and you know, why would something, I don't care if it's a coyote or a bear, or a cougar, or a deer, a Sasquatch, why would it be in this area this time of year? And what's making these noises? And you can visually look at this stuff, you know, through Audacity or Sonic Visualizer on a spectrograph and compare them to norm, known animals and rule them in or out. So that's something we've been working heavily on. Chris Spencer, I got to give him a shout out because he's been working heavily on that. Uh, David Ellis as well. Uh, you had on a few, or I think you had on recently. Um, so um, that is, um, that's one of the, the goals we have going forward. And, and like I said, data, we're data driven. Now, uh, we really don't take donations. Uh, we used to do public expeditions which we may get back into to kind of show people what we do, how we do it, how we collect data, uh, how to, you know, DNA kits, uh, you know, how to cast a track. We bring in speakers like Dr. Meldrum or Cliff Berrickman or uh, Thomas Steenberg's another one we've had up there um, to engage with people. Uh, we may get back into that because at least somebody, we feel like they're getting something for the, you know, more than just helping us out. Uh, we don't really, we don't do donations. Uh, and I, I, money's a tricky thing and I don't like to deal with it. We basically, most of our stuff is done through our own pocket. Um, um, actually all of it, <laughs> it gets very expensive, but, uh, we, uh, we appreciate those people that want to, um, maybe we'll get back into the expeditions where they can meet us and get to know us. And then we can go from there. But, uh, uh, as far as that, not really taking any donations, but to find us, uh, we are, we do have a website called olympicproject.com. You can find us there. There's a lot of, um, interesting, things i think you'll pick up there we do have a running blog um down the road here we will be updating it uh, it's been a, a little stagnant because a lot of us you know we have daytime jobs and with the pandemic it's put us a lot of us behind and we spend a tremendous amount of time in the woods i'm out in the woods at least three or four times a week uh, along with some of my partners 
I just got back from a, a four day trip out to Northern Washington or Western Washington. So we're out in the woods a lot. So we will be updating the website. <clears throat> the best way, honestly, to hear about what's going on with the Olympic project in some of my own personal stuff is my podcast, Monster X Radio, which I host. Um, I'd be, I'm kind of taking a little break, but I'll be getting back at it. But if you go look at our archive, um, our archived uh, shows, you'll learn a lot about many things I haven't touched upon today, uh, with in, which include the Nest Study site and some of the other things we've been working on, some of our other findings, some of our ideas, and we bring in lots of guests, interesting guests as well. And uh, we'll be, I'll be hitting that hard again here down the road um, coming into the fall here. So that's the best way to, to get caught up with us. I like to share stuff. Um, that's one of the best ways. The other, uh, the only other platform we have is we do a lot of speaking engagements, which I'm going to be peeling away from. Uh, I've done quite a few over the years. Um, my time is better spent in the field, but I will do occasionally speaking engagements and symposiums, conferences, and I like to share information there. Um, I hate to uh, do a lot of stuff on Facebook because everybody wants to argue. Social media, I don't really care for it. But uh, face to face, and I could show you what I'm talking about at a symposium or whatever have you. Uh, that's my that's my favorite way to do it. Uh, that way, you can look me in the eye, and it's not just something posted on Facebook, and you know you get to argue about it, and you want me to respond back because I don't have time to. So. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, I thank you so much. I encourage everybody to go out and check out the olympicproject.com. Definitely check out Monster X Radio. It's awesome. Thank you so much, Shane, for coming on the show, man, and giving us the time. I really appreciate it. I've had an awesome time talking to you. Brian, uh, thank you very much for having me on. I, I appreciate your comments and feedback and input there. So thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Awesome, man. That was great. Cool, man. I always well, say it. It's like you you wish that the people that you hear on other shows are the people you think they are. <laughs> and I'm a pretty good judge of character. I could usually tell when, when people are, you know, some people are a little bit prima donna, but that, that was. <laughs> well, yeah, you being a former, you know, in, in a police officer or whatever, have you? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you're a good read. Um, prima donnas. Yeah, there's no expert in this field. I'm sure as heck no expert, I, but I love talking about Sasquatch. I'll tell you. Yeah, man. I, and I, I definitely, I, I had, I wanted, you were on my, my short list, my bucket list to get on the show. Uh, Matt Pruitt, who I met up at Smoky. Oh, Mountain he's Day amazing. Conference. I love Matt. Yeah, man. He was phenomenal. He, he emceed that, that um, it was my first Bigfoot conference and yeah. he emceed the thing. And as soon as I walked into the, the area where all the tables and vendors were, and I walked right past Matt and he was like, Hey, Brian, because I had on one of my shirts with the the logo and he was like, hey, I recognize your logo, but he has guy. been, he's been a phenomenal resource. And, uh, I, he, I said it on the show. I think my, my IQ went up about 50 points, just spending an hour talking to Matt. He's, he's something so else. he's, I got a lot of, uh, I'm just really impressed with Matt. He's such a good guy, very knowledgeable, well-spoken. I love the guy to death. Uh, you know, and that's why I'm a fan of NOAC, uh, what they do and they're, their academic scientific procedures uh we, we've collaborated a little bit over the years and yeah big fan big yeah. time and sorry i had that little coughing attack earlier man my throat was i think i was talking too long i'll do that at conferences sometimes i get on a gamut and all of a sudden i'm like oh i need my water yeah so yeah, sorry about that, you have to edit that part. Show. yeah i'll i'll go through and, and edit the show and get it ready to go um i have no idea when it'll air i mean but i'll probably no get it out in the next few weeks um when i had david and julie on a week or so ago she was going through a storm from leftovers from the hurricane she's here in north carolina as well yeah and uh we had a lot of audio and technical issues but uh david and i pushed through and we we finished the show so i'm gonna good hopefully get it out next friday and then uh this one will be not too far behind maybe we can collaborate sometime in the future man when you get back up on the doing the podcast thing or whatever we maybe yeah. we'll do something yeah. together eventually That'd be, be awesome. Yeah. Let me know, man. I'm like I said, I'm taking a little break. Cause I've been, I've been spending a lot of time in the woods. Um, my, uh, so, uh, I don't, uh, the podcast thing's another thing. It's just fun for me. I've been doing it since about 2013 yeah, and I'd like to do it, but only on my terms. <laughs> yeah. It's, I love doing the show. I started it as a hobby and it just sort of snowballed and, and really picked up and ramped up and, and, people are enjoying it i got a pretty huge audience and you do a fantastic job i i went sorry to interrupt you but i i did go back and listen to a couple of your shows i always try to do that before i jump on someone's show and uh so you got a fan here you do a great job 
I really good. It very yeah. much, man. Really good job. Well, I'll let you go, man. I got to get ready for another interview here. In short, okay. You're so. busy. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a great night, man. And I, I do, I really, really appreciate your time. I, I've had a blast. Dude, Brian, no, pleasure's all mine. Thanks for having me again, man. Really all right, like, buddy, have really a good enjoyed one. It. You too. Good night. Bye.